Continuamos con nuestro segundo foro del valor del diseño. No sin antes agradecer a nuestros patrocinadores, Cuchar Estudio y Déjate Querer, por el mobiliario y las esculturas que visten este escenario producido por Waterhouse Art Direction, así como al Departamento de Comunicación de la Universidad Iberoamericana por las instalaciones y equipo del foro de televisión. A continuación vamos a tener una conferencia de parte del gran Levanovich, quien es uno de los principales teóricos de los nuevos medios, la cultura digital y las humanidades digitales, así como diseñador, escritor y artista. Lev ha sido incluido en la lista de 25 personas que están dando forma al futuro del diseño, así como la de 50 personas más interesantes que están construyendo el futuro. En la actualidad es profesor presencial en el Graduate Center de la City University de Nueva York, así como director del Cultural Analytics Lab. Una de sus últimas publicaciones es el libro, en coautoría con Emanuel Arieli, AI Aesthetics, A Critical Guide to AI, Media and Design. Libro que trata desde una perspectiva crítica y fundamentada ciertas posibilidades de implementación de la inteligencia artificial en las industrias y entornos creativos. Eh, I'm delighted to give the floor without further ado to Dr. Levmanovich. Thank you very much to be with, with us. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my talk is going to be a bit unusual. Because normally people think of me as a kind of media theorist, and they want me to give a lecture and make various points, and I will do that Great. in the second part of the talk. Uh, but uh, in the first part of the talk, uh, and we'll be talking about um, artificial, visual artificial intelligence, and specifically explosion of uh, uh, so-called AI image synthesis. Right, uh, software which maybe some we heard about, such as Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, Google Imaging, uh, Dali E, and so on. And uh, literally, this explosion took place over the summer. Uh, the software was released, millions of people start using it. I know so many theorists who start write, who stop writing books and articles for a while, you know, architecture theorists and ours and also started to use the software. Um, but in my case, um, not everybody knows. I mean, people, many people who are a bit older in media arts know about it, but younger people don't know that my original background was a bit of an artist. I was trained in art since the age of 12, when I was still living in Moscow, uh, when I studied in a Moscow architecture school. And after immigrating to America, to New York in 1981, I continued my studies at the New York University Film School. Uh, and then uh, decided that film is maybe too heavy, maybe too complicated, too many people involved. And I was able to get a job in one of my first companies, uh, which was using uh, 3D computer graphics to do visual effects, you know, logos, uh, titles for film and television. In fact, uh, sometime before I joined this company, the company is called Digital Effects, that company made the logo, you know, the, the title sequence for the original Tron, right? the first movie uh, which relied heavily on computer-generated effects. Um, and then, you know, I realized that I really want to understand more how visual communication works and I also want to understand what computers are going to do to culture. So eventually I got a PhD, uh, but then something strange happened again after I got my PhD in 93, I started teaching, uh, you know, in various American universities, but in the art departments, in effect, my position was always of a studio artist, right? So even though I had a PhD, most of my classes, and I've been now teaching for exactly 30 years, since 92, I mean, most of my classes were always studio classes, in digital arts, digital design, uh, where students would be working on their projects, uh, and I would give them advice, or sometimes I would teach them programming, and Photoshop, and everything else. Um, so I do think of myself actually as an artist, which just happened to be very curious about how images work, and why we like certain images more, and also an artist who kind of responds 
and uses the new technologies of our time. So maybe if I was living 100 years earlier, I would be working in photography or film, uh, but coming of age in the 80s, I realized that the new media of our time is going to be computer, computer graphics, and then later we got internet and social media, you know, virtual reality and interactivity, and of course, artificial intelligence, which, as you know, has been already invented, and people started researching AI in the 1950s, but only after the computers reached a certain speed, uh, and uh, the older technology, which already was available, which is neural networks, uh, became practical, and after 2013, we've been living through what some people call AI spring, right? And this is the reference to so-called AI winter, which in fact, uh, in the history of artificial intelligence research, we had two winters, uh, which were periods when, you know, AI research was not doing well, it wasn't funded, but now we have a spring, uh, you know, you see yourself in the last few years, amazing progress in automatic translation between languages, voice understanding, uh, recognition of images, in faces, computer vision, and then the spring and summer, uh, in fact, it started late spring, so we can we can call this perhaps visual AI spring. This explosion, right, a kind of, of amazing new technology, uh, sometimes called diffusion models. Uh, so the basic idea is that uh, you know, we scrape a web to obtain data sets which have uh, billions of uh, images and their descriptions, right, so image and title. And then uh, this is used to train neural networks. And originally, you know, we take like a noise, a random you know, image where all the pixels are just randomly black and white. And then the network is trained to uh, kind of turn, right, using a given description, it is trained to create the image which, which originally corresponded to the description. And after lots of training, which costs uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, eventually the network learns, right, all kinds of relationships, and then you can now give it a new sentence or a few sentences, right, you can write a text which call a prompt, and then the network will generate new image, and now already in the last few weeks we see some progress, not just image generation, but also video. Um, so what I'll do in the, you know, first show you some examples, some announcements, if you're not aware of these developments, and then I'll show you examples of my own artworks, which I've been creating uh, using these tools. And then I will present a few theoretical point, points. Um, so since uh, July, I've been almost you know, a few times a week, I've been posting my images, and sometimes I would also post kind of theoretical notes. So now I can take all these notes and write a book chapter. So I like this. You know, so I was very happy to be engaged in like, a real time this amazing period of innovation. And uh, that's why my presentation will be maybe a bit impressionistic, right? Because I'm not talking about something which happened in the past and we don't have historical distance. And maybe a few months from now, you know, the, the capabilities will become more amazing. And what we find today unbelievable will not be so, will not be so. But for now, it is really unbelievable. So let me share the screen. Uh, good. So, as I said, uh, there, are not, there are a few companies uh, or research labs, as we call them, uh, which implementing this technology make it available for everybody else. So, one is called Stability AI. Uh, this company have actually released this model in this neural network, which it trained, because I guess it realizes. If it releases, lots of people will be advancing it, finding uses, and everybody will benefit, right? And of course, all the images you see in these announcements are also generated by these tools. Okay. Um, so this is the information, right? So we you know, so it can make very detailed kind of fantastical scenes, right? You can make portraits of people which don't exist. You can see it can suddenly smoke. Uh, and, and these networks, and you'll see why a bit later, are particularly adapt in creating very kind of dramatic, very spectacular scenes and landscapes. Um, and uh, 
I mean, you can install the software if you have Windows PC and use it for free. I mean, I have Macintosh, so I'm paying like ten dollars, about one thousand images, and I use the company interface, which is also very handy. And then another uh, similar kind of research startup uh, is called Midjourney. Okay, and you inter and and this company, this startup, specifically decided that we want uh, everybody to be generating the images in the open because the idea was we wanted the people learn from each other, be being influenced from each other. So we interact with our software, right? I mean, you can pay more. I mean, you also have to pay 10 or $30 a month to get a certain number of credits, which you can use to make images, and you can pay more. And then the images which you're making will be only visible to you. But I guess most people don't want to pay $20 extra. And uh, this is how it works, right? So uh, you basically Discord, which is a kind of social chat network, and various channels. And every time there are hundreds of people in the channel, and what happens, right? Are people are typing these texts, right? And then and then it will generate images. And uh, so we can, and, and you know, since there are many people using it at the same time, right? You kind of have to scroll. Okay, so we can go all the way down, jump to the present. And for me, you know, um, it was both very useful because I can learn from our people what to type, right? For example, what particular parameters or keywords to use to, make, to get a particular lighting, a particular static, particular rendering effect, right? But also, it's a unique opportunity for me as a digital culture researcher, right? Because it gives me a window into actually how people use this technology, right? Uh, and I also saw a bit how this process works of co-creation, uh, like every time I will type what I think is was very successful prompt, I will see very quickly somebody using this prompt, and sometimes I would also use right prompts of other people. So let's say, you know, maybe I like, maybe I like this image. So, but right, I mean, I can just copy it, you know, copy it, and put it here, you know, and modify some parameters. And of course, I can also write my own things, um, and uh, this is how it works, right? Um, so when we look in this uh, Discord channels, what we see right away is something which is different from a kind of rhetoric of uh, unlimited creativity which surrounds this technology, right? Um, so people make different claims, right? And of course, the companies also which make this technology make different claims, but it's going to be the tool a new tool for visual communication where people who can't make, you know, who can't draw or, uh, you know, want to explain some ideas to each other. Uh, that's right. I mean, it's also promoted as an artistic tool. It's already, of course, used by concept artists or maybe people using visual effects, video games. So you see lots of images like this. And then there is also lots of controversy about copyright, who owns these images. And some artists got very unhappy that we found that the images which were online were scraped and then used for training. Uh, you know, this all been happening only for a few months. It's very exciting. But when I look at this, right, as a, you know, and me being a student of visual culture and art historian, you know, I do see right, not unlimited creativity, even though I found out that if you try hard enough, you know, there are definitely walls, right? Certain things you can't generate in the software so far, but you can generate many more things which you see here. So what we see here, but what we see here is I think certain prevalence of particular types of images, particular aesthetics, and it reflects not the limitations or the biases so much of uh, software such as Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, but rather the kind of interest, right, and the aesthetic preferences of people who use the software, right? So for whatever reason, it attracts, of course, you have lots of images like this, um, but mostly it's, you know, sometimes people making, for example, logos, but mostly it's something which I would call ArtStation. You know, ArtStation is a very popular website where I think both people in game industry and people who want to work in game industry share their portfolios. So it's characters, it's concepts, environments. So it's a kind of Hollywoody video games, uh, fantasy, a kind of universe, right? And, uh, you know, and then, you know, why it is, that's also a different question, right? 
So partly it can be in effect, right, in effect of what me, what, what the software makes possible, but partly it's it's what these people like to do. Okay. Now, just to show you, but you can also do very different things. Uh, these tools have also been taken up by architects. Uh, in fact, I'll be going to University of Michigan um, in two weeks and speaking and participating in a large conference about architects using the software. And architects use the software both in a very pragmatic way, as a way to try new ideas for real buildings, or maybe a way to generate new textures for facades, but also is a way to make more fantastical so-called paper architecture. And this is uh, Cesare Batelli, one of my favorite people in the genre, right? So he's architect, he's maybe close to my age. So maybe that's why his work is visually conceptually more sophisticated, right? You can see it right away. So here he just said this morning his article and all illustrations are also made by the same software. So as you can see, you know, if you want to explore particular niche, particular types of images, particular aesthetics or poetics, you can also do that. And, you know, if you spend days and months, just as you would do with every medium, the images will get more sophisticated. So he's been kind of working on this imaginary architecture, uh, you know, the whole summer. Okay. Uh, now we look at this. So now let me show you a bit, you know, what I've been doing, right? And I think of this image is both as my real artworks. And in fact, you know, since I started posting them in July, I was already invited to participate in four exhibitions. In fact, I was invited by a cultural center in Portugal to have like a large one person show uh, in a building which has few floors. So people definitely recognize this, this art, but at the same time, it's my kind of probes, my experiments to understand how this new media works and then make, write something about it. Um, so, uh, so I'll just show you some, exa some examples of what I've been doing and explain the concepts. Uh, and partly, you know, I was interested to try many different things. And I think you'll see that what I'm doing, or like this architect, people like us who actually have a bit of a different background than most people using these tools, you know, what we end up with is also very different. So you can use these tools to actually kind of fit your individual vision, although it takes uh, a particular effort, and why it is, we'll see in a second. So before I show you my recent AI images, I will show you examples of drawings I was doing in my 20s, so you understand where I was coming from. So for instance, for example, you know, drawing pen on paper, right? Uh, I'm not sure if it was 82, 87, so somewhere in this period in the 80s, after I already came to US, and then you saw some close-ups. You know, so probably took me I mean, I wasn't drawing, okay, right, eight hours a day. I would draw a bit, but maybe it took me two weeks to make these drawings. And definitely, these AI tools for now are not able to create this level of details. And also, mm, I think we're not able to create the specificity and the uniqueness of these details. But when you, I'll show you what I've done and compare, right? So this is the kind of things I was doing. Uh, and this is something else. And in fact, these drawings were done after I left uh, USSR. So we're a bit like nostalgic or critical, right? So we present with a kind of theatrical environment because when I was living under communism in USSR in the 70s, I felt that I'm living right in a kind of a, in a kind of giant theater where everybody is performing a role. Um, but it's also a kind of theater where there is no escape, right? There is no escape. Uh, let me show you some more images from a period. Uh, and there is a particular kind of melancholic, rundown, uh, somewhat sad, right, space. Um, let's see if I can, I think. Yeah, so for example, this is like when I took a class in etching when I was 22, this was like the first etching I'd done, right? And again, a kind of space, which is for people who live where maybe looks like real universe, but looking outside, we see it's very really limited. It's almost like a little flat earth, so to speak, right? Self-enclosed. So this is an example. Uh, oops. Okay. And uh, 
you know, and then uh, and then this is you know I was also doing more realistic uh, graphic works. So this is a portrait of my mother, which I drew with a technical pen on tracing paper. So I did this when I was around eighteen or seventeen. Okay, and here you can see what um, I was very interested in atmosphere. So in fact, this drawing right is made from mm, a kind of sorry, not what I wanted to show. Okay. Okay, let's go back here, right? Uh, the idea was that we don't really have separate objects in empty space, like, you know, like, like the way it's understand Cartesian uh, geometry. However, we have this continuous kind of thick, filled in painting, you know, painting space, and sometimes the space thickens and creates for objects. So everything is made from the same stuff, right, which happens to be kind of just the lines, right, the cross-hatching, but I also do this in painting. And this idea, of course, is quite common to 20th century art. So this is where I was coming from in my experiments with my journey, partly what I was curious to see if I can actually get something, not maybe similar subject, but somewhat of a similar statics. Okay, so let's see, let's look at some examples. Um, so this was, you know, like some of some, the some first experiments. I think this was July. And uh, to get these effects, you know, you can also specify medium and you can also specify artist names when you use the software. So I think I specified something like 70th century etching or 70th century engraving, monochrome, you know, and I got something, you know, which doesn't have the same detail as my original drawings, but I think does have more or less similar mood. Um, okay. Uh, another thing I was done, I did, was uh, like when you use the software, right? You can type the same text called prompt over and over and have a software generate new and new images. Or you can also take one of the images and just generate versions. So I was curious to see what will happen. So I kind of started with a single image, something like this. And then I would generate versions, and, and the mid journey would generate four versions. And then, if you like any of these versions, you can regenerate them to see if I will find a kind of evolution. And that was very, very so. This is eventually I did about 225 images. So, here I'm just showing you a few. So, first of all, apparently the software learned about aesthetics and composition and color and balance, right? Because, you know, my prompt didn't specify anything about these parameters. The prompt will say something like still, something like modern, still life, uh, you know, bottles and glasses on the table, uh, something like 1930s. So, you know, the AI you know, came up in each time with colors and composition and texture. And, you know, as a painter, I can tell you that I would be happy to paint any of these paintings and, of course, be able to ge generate hundreds of them in a couple of hours is amazing. Okay. So here we can see, you know, the computer is doing, 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 and at some point, suddenly we get this kind of blue bottle out of nowhere. It's almost an example of strange artificial evolution. Um, and then I, in the same time, I continued to make drawings. So this was like, right, one of the first drawings I made actually in the summer, and I haven't been drawing for 30 years. And probably partly I was influenced by my kind of AI experiments, realizing that with a particular kind of subtlety, a particular level of detail, which I can do. Uh, so perhaps, you know, this emerge is my response to the system. Okay? And again, you can see kind of creating a space out of these points, a bit like pointillism, where object in the space share the same quality. Um, so some more images. Okay, so then uh, I give a series of images. This is AI now, uh, which I call architecture for the snow planet. And here what's interesting, right, uh, my prompt would be something like like um, abstract space of different kinds of snow, you know, melancholic, and I didn't say anything about the content of the space, right? So my so journey out of its artificial unconscious have generated sometimes this kind of like baroque, strange, a bit grotesque or gothic structures, okay? And sometimes modern structures, okay? And here we have different kinds of snow, which I was able to get. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, another series uh, where I kind of came back to the motif 
which interested me, you know, my teens and twenties, which is we can feed a stage, right, to life as a performance. Um, and just as in my early drawings, I wasn't really interested in the plot. I wasn't really interested, like, right, in writing a story, but rather just creating a particular environment, a particular atmosphere, right? So here are uh, mid journey generated again spaces, and we will have some snow falling here. We can see through the light. Uh, and a particular here, right? Particular atmosphere. Okay. I'm not going to show all of it, don't worry. Um, and then this is the series of images. So I get this idea that uh, I want to see pieces of paper with some kind of manuscript. So imagine a writer writing a manuscript, even erasing parts of a manuscript. Um, so this kind of writing process. And I've, seen, I've seen photographs like this, they're really beautiful. So it's interesting with the AI. Right, actually fill these pages, right, with writing. Uh, if you look closely, it's not in any human language, <laughs> but it does look very suggestive. So, so I basically set pieces of paper with like partly erased writing and, uh, you know, all the images here I generated were kind of fascinating. Um, and, you know, partly I'm also, also thinking about censorship, right? And, you know, so many talented creators, artists, writers, musicians who couldn't express themselves because we lived in various governments, like, you know, like, or, or states like Soviet Union, or like, you know, China today, or in fact, in Russia again today, right, uh, where there is a censorship. And sometimes people would write a story and only would show to like where, you know, where like wife or husband or close friends. So lots of, so maybe the best 20th century novels, the best 20th century paintings were never painted, were never written, because people were afraid that if it would be discovered, you know, we'll go to prison. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Okay, and then uh, maybe I'll show you one more thing. And then uh, this is maybe a series of images, which I got lots of positive remarks. So of course, there's a reference to, uh, actually there is a reference to, to uh, Hiroshima's Bosch, right? The famous, uh, what is now Netherlands artist right? from Northern Renaissance. It's very grotesque. But there's also strange details. So, for example, the prompt which I use here was like a giant airport designed in Siberia, in Russia, in 1960s, as painted by Bosch, right? So, again, I'm actually bringing maybe invisibly to lots of audience, like the references to my biography, the references to my early art, the references to my history, um, and then creating a strange visual hybrid uh, and people said, maybe you made reference to Malevich, maybe it reference to Kandinsky. And actually, I didn't. Uh, but I think maybe there's some reference to kind of futuristic architecture. Anyways, I think this is enough. I mean, I can show you more. I mean, you can find this on my Instagram uh, and also Facebook. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll just show you one last thing. Um, so, and then, you know, we'll develop some theoretical points. So as I said, I'm also very much fascinated. Uh, actually, I didn't say it. Sorry, <laughs> I will say it now, right? So I'm also very fascinated uh, by the potential use of the systems to recreate the past. Like if you go on YouTube today, you find many videos of some films from 1900 to even 1890 to 1910, which were colorized, and the resolution was increased, and motion was approved using machine learning, right? Using AI. And it looked very uncanny. Uh, this morning I was watching scenes from uh, Metropolis, right? A famous movie from 1927, which were colorized. And it's really very strange, uncanny feeling, right? As though you actually present were on the set in 1927. Uh, but of course, the systems are learning, right? Based upon available data. And let's say there's more data on the web about how the New York looked in 1981 when how Moscow looked in 1967. Uh, the images of Moscow you would see from the spirit would be more official, uh, you know, so various kind of communist ideological images or images of Red Square. So every time I you know, put Moscow in a prompt, I get images which inevitably have some references to Red Square to churches. So in this series, I made a few series, uh, which I call Russian Youth. Uh, so partly, of course, it's my response to the war, to the uh, to travel things which are happening in Russia and, and wondering about if Russia has any future. 
in my lifetime. And partly it's about memory and history. So I, I said, okay, maybe so the prompt I would use would be something like Russian um, uh, students in 10th year, 10th year grade of a high school in Russia in 1976. Uh, and I would actually change the year. Sometimes I would say 66, 76, 86. And what's interesting, even though I wouldn't specify any photographic parameters, right, the, the AI learned something about history of media, right, history of photography. So uh, I would get sometimes images which seem to have some reference to kind of photographic techniques of the time. Uh, but here I also said like mist or fog. Uh, to hide the kind of mistakes AI is doing. Um, so this is one series. And then um, this is another series where let the image is more sharp, right? Uh, called Russian Youth. And you can see how sometimes it's like the same face. So it's very uncanny. Sometimes every face is different. So it's also very, very fascinating. Uh, the kind of dialogue between repetition and variability in the systems. Okay. And uh, just show you maybe, and then this was actually the first series I've done. And here, perhaps it does look like a street in Moscow, although it's hard to say. Um, and as I said, when I write, when I, when I generate these images, I also write, you know, sometimes theoretical posts. So there's a whole post called Unpredictable Past. Okay. So partly I'm imagining how uh, people in my high school have looked, right? So in 1976, I was also in the 10th grade of Moscow High School. Um, and then we also get the strange artifacts. Uh, so sometimes very uncanny. So some people were terrified, but I actually find them very, very charming. So now let me uh, present uh, two or three theoretical points uh, about um, my kind of reflections, right? About what's going on here. Um, so if we go back, right? If we go back to, uh, if we go back to how this Discord, and you see, right, how normal people, right? Uh, by normal, I mean, of course, we can be trained artists, illustrators, or we can be just, you know, uh, I think many of them have training. You know, how do we write? How do we use it? You know, we have a variety of things, right? So here's somebody actually generating uh, a kind of simulation of historical photo, which is very interesting. Uh, here's somebody generating a realistic portrait, you know, and then lots of it, as I said, this kind of fantasy images of human figures, faces, with definitely gender bias here, right? So maybe lots of users are men. Uh, you know, and we see like the same user generating things over and over. We see that most images are three-dimensional, but sometimes we do get graphic art. Uh, and uh, we just switch to different channels to see something else, right? Um, so what happened is that in August, the company approved their network, their model, and it became possible to generate uh, more photorealistic images, right? So before that, I saw more people experimenting with abstraction because you can also make abstract art and all kinds of art, but people are obsessed with generating human likeness. So there's something about you know, here which reflects a kind of popular idea of art as art as skill, as a representation of humans and uh, lots and lots of faces and also, you know, the landscapes, right? Landscapes kind of fantasy scenes and so on and so forth. So what's going on here, right? And uh, where does this where does this aesthetics come from? Okay. So obviously part of it comes from descriptions, okay? But if you look at this description, potentially it can give rise to you know, millions of very different images, right? Even images, the ones I'm making, which are more moody, more foggy, right? Let's say depressing, melancholic. But what we get is something which is bright, saturated, high contrast, uh, often with a single concept, right, such as a person in the center. So we actually do get, with all this variability, we do get a particular state. So where does it come from? Well, so it so happens that if you go to a stable, so that's one of the companies, right, stable diffusion, stable stability AI, if you go to a website, we say, well, our model was trained on a particular data set, right? So here's the announcement. And here are links to this data sets, right? So I actually clicked, right? I actually clicked. Uh, and here it says, right? Uh, so this was the announcement, I think, in September. 
that um, we use this data set called Lion 5B, right? So it's publicly available data set of, fi of uh, 5.6 billion images and where uh, descriptions were over, right? Sentences describing them, which was scraped from a web. But not only, right? So it's not just any images because most images in the web are going to be random and not necessarily beautiful, right? So the question is how come you know, how come people getting automatically such beautiful, right? Such beautiful in a particular way, such aesthetically pleasing, again, in a particular way, outputs. Well, so it turns out here, right, that after the cyber nonprofit created this data set, we have used another neural network, right, another model, which was trained to predict people's judgments of what is beautiful, what is pleasing. And then this data set, of you know five uh, five point six billion images was filtered, and only images which uh, received a high score were used for this network. Okay, so what are these images? Let's take a look. Right. Um, so here is uh, right. I'm mean, here is the cyber company Lion AI, and you know this uh, focused on developing this data set, right? So etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And here, you know, we just like a sample. Um, so it's organized in terms of its ratings, right? So it's a uh, neural network predictions of a static quality of its images starting right from zero and going all the way to seven and to eight. And uh, you'll see kind of what the model is doing. But the model originally was trained on humans, in fact, on the users of the same software and the users of stability diffusion who ranked certain number of images, and this data was used, right, to train the model. So what we have is a very kind of dangerous, right, loop, you know, where people like particular images, we like particular aesthetics, that maybe comes from commercial photography, from popular visual culture, fantasy illustrations, Hollywood, and so on. Even the model, right, is trained to replicate with aesthetic preferences, and then it's going to choose only with images, and these images are going to be used for training, so when people are going to be generating images, this is the kind of images the system is going to generate, thorough propagating this aesthetics. So it's fascinating to look at this data set, right? So we can see that the images which the model predicts as being least beautiful are often, right, because web is full of this, web is full of these images. Often it just, you know, can be blurred, right, or out of focus, but it's just text, right? Although here we have some piece of graphic design. Um, so lots of it is this text, graphic design, we don't see any photography, right? Here it starts. Yeah, and definitely these are not clean, sharp, contrasty, award-winning images will associate with beautiful in popular culture, right? And then, you know, I will, keep, I will keep scrolling down here, okay? So this is two, I'll just go a bit faster, okay? So let's say when now we get to three, okay? So now we we'll see what something happened. First of all, images are very sharp uh, and uh, they're better designed and very more clean and more clear, but we're still mostly graphic design. And when we get to, let's say, keep going down, okay, keep going down, we get to, okay, we get to five, and now we start seeing photography. Right? And you notice that often there's are photographs which have neutral background, so we can design for a mobile phone perception, right, for easy visual processing. Um, and again, we're also dominated by often a single subject, uh, so it's something designed to be seen very quickly in this age of kind of mobile perception, advertising, uh, fast attention. And we're still only photographs, right? So this is about five, right? So it's on a scale of one to ten. Um, and then only when we get to higher, when we get to higher, now we start looking, now we start seeing paintings, right? And when I say paintings, I don't mean like Rembrandt's or Van Gogh's. I mean, often we are 19th century realistic painting, but typically it will be contemporary or 20th century painting, which you wouldn't really find in MoMA's or Guggenheim museums because we don't associate with high culture, with conceptual art or video, but in fact, this is what people like. It's popular visual culture. Right, and again, you can see they're very clean, they're sharp. Often we have, not always, but often we have, you know, higher saturation. 
the colors are balanced. So we can follow all the rules of good photography or good images. Uh, and we kind of design to grab your attention, right? So high contrast, simple composition. And uh, this is what the system is trained for. And then as we keep going down, what's interesting, right? Is by the time we get to seven, there is less photography and only get these paintings, right? So this is like an input, which is used to the system, okay? So, and it forms, you can say, kind of, kind of unconscious, right? It's kind of unconscious of visual AI. So when people generate their own images, uh, this is what's going on, right? So this is the so-called bias, right? Or we can say kind of metaphorically speaking, visual unconscious. And uh, while most of the images are not maybe as perfect, again, from point of view of aesthetics, they definitely you know, have aesthetic qualities, they're not random. And I think this is why people are so attracted to this medium. Um, so I still have maybe 15 minutes. So let me make some more points and uh, to speed things up, I'm actually going to read them so you can follow them. Um, so this is, in fact, what I was talking, telling you today, this analysis of an underlying data set. I just looked at this this morning and I just was writing these points to my friend, my book author. Uh, we're publishing a book online since last December called Artificial Aesthetics. So we exchange ideas even in the right chapters. Um, so I basically said images are very diverse. So certainly we don't have a single aesthetics and many are designs as opposed to art and photos. But do we have something in common? We do. Uh, what I would call a commercial look. What does it mean? They are clear, high contrast, often high saturation, energetic, easy to read, efficient. In other words, the examples of contemporary visual communication as opposed to something which in fact was often celebrated and explored by 20th century artists, uh, something which would be unclear, undefined, unfocused, chaotic, random, so I'm thinking of adjectives which are opposite of the idea of communication, right? Um, so what we have is, even though we're very different, we have a kind of meta-aesthetics. Meta, not because it's about particular look and feel, but it's about more general qualities which can be found in a variety of visual genres in media, from photography to graphic design to painting. Okay? Uh, now, does this reflect contemporary popular taste? So people presumably without any art or art theory training, I mean, many people here perhaps have art training, but maybe we didn't go to and get masters in fine arts and we're not trained in the history of conceptual art, the video art, land art, and so on. Um, so does it mean that normal people or people who maybe trained, took some classes or self-trained in art, we think of popular painting as the most aesthetic because it is popular paintings which are given the highest aesthetic scores where commercial photos are less aesthetic, the graphic design is even less aesthetic, right? So, so that's interesting because if this is correct, it means that in popular culture, the idea of aesthetic is associated with fine art. So images which were clearly painted, they were using digital traditional tools rather than photography or visual genres. Uh, let me let's say a few more things. So this was one point. Okay. Let's see, I'm going to go here. Um, so I also have this little note where I'm trying to use the term postmodernism. So postmodernism, as some of you know, was a term introduced and used very widely in the 80s to talk about the new, again, meta-aesthetics of culture, not just visual culture, but also literature and film. Uh, you know, the idea that these works had lots of quotations, they kind of collages, very often ironic, uh, but but that was before Photoshop, that was before digital software. In the 90s, digital software such as Photoshop, After Effects, and, and so on, you know, right, became available, and now you can make collages very, very quickly. So I'm saying that Photoshop, introduced in 1990, was per, per, perhaps a perfect software for post-modern periods. In the arts, postmodernism, which was, let's say, 70s, 80s, and maybe 90s, meant Lots of quotations, references to art that came before, irony, pastiche, intertextuality, which basically simply means references to our works. And then in the 1990s, Photoshop made this aesthetics available to people without any art training. So what about mid-journey stable diffusion of our tools? 
do we kind of continue with the idea of Photoshop? Because, you know, you can basically reference any historical period, right? Different styles of photography, different styles of paintings. Uh, you can reference old maps. You can reference you know, old illustrations. You can reference styles of particular artists. So it seems to be like a postmodernism, right? But on another level, but maybe this is, you know, a too simple idea. So I'm suggesting that Midjourney and other similar tools take this much further because you can specify many artists. For example, when I was making my landscapes, right, I said in the style of Bosch or in the style of Malevich, rendering techniques, cultural references, a majority kind of composites with references together. So this is not simply postmodernism. In fact, I would like to call it postmedia. Uh, it comes after 30 years of internet, digital software, the web, social media, and uh, websites like ArtStation, DeviantArt, Behance, right? It's something which has only became possible to do today. And I have an hour note about it. Uh, and here I was specifically talking about mid-journey, but I think the same thing applies to stable diffusion. So I basically say that while many people think of these tools as eventually enabling a like, new type of uh, visual communication where everybody can describe something to somebody else without having to hire an illustrator or trying to draw a sketch. This may happen, uh, but I think what we see so far, right, is this kind of fascination with particular kind of images and particular kind of aesthetics on this website, in particular people who are drawn to this, is something else. So I, 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 I want to suggest that what we're seeing is that the CI imagery is a form of media art, not of communication, not of visual arts, but a form of media art. Why? Uh, Midjourney and other similar tools are only possible after enough images of artworks, illustrations, concept art, video game art, Hollywood films, and so on became available on the internet. And now it can be scraped and used to train a very big neural network. This is why I think such tools, well, such tools could not exist 20 years ago, not only because of technical limitations of computers, which would prevent training such networks, but also because with training data sets were not available because a big part of culture was not digital yet. The masses of digital cultural images and no new visual publications were not online yet. So it's only in the last 15 years that every artist, designer uh, have to make a portfolio, put their stuff on Instagram, uh, TikTok and so on, right? Where online visual presence became not an option, but a requirement. Uh, I also think that this AI image generation can be called a form of media art because lots of images uh, users create in a way use media aesthetics as their content, right? So, uh, of course, we do specify, right? We do specify, you know, like what's where, but if you look at where kind of prompts, um, right? A big part, right? A big part of a text is not description of the content, but actually description of a media effect the person wants to see, right? Realistic, hyper-realistic, 8K, dramatic, Unreal Engine, this is references to rendering engines, large pain strokes, right? And so on and so forth. I mean, we can look at somebody else. Uh, you know, it's, it's different, it changes, right? But ultimately, here it is, right? So you have a whole bunch of references to the kind of history of media, media effects, and history of art, which describe the kind of feeling of the image, right? Uh, and then you get something very specific, right? Whereas Pretty Girl is only, you can say, like 10% of a whole prompt. So this is why uh, I make this argument that we see image generation today, in a way, can be thought as a form of media art because lots of users create images where most of the references, most of the content of the prompts is, in fact, media static. So we use terms like Unreal 5, Red Racing, 35 millimeter photograph, etching, or painting, insane details, photorealism, establishing shot, AK, and so on. Right? Often, this and other aesthetic effects is the real focus of mid-journey images. Because with reasons, I can claim that mid-journey and stable diffusion in Dali universe is really about media as opposed to kind of visualizing 
concepts or ideas in your brain, right? It's really about particular media effects uh, and the history of these effects. Um, you can switch to different channels, okay? Uh, right? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You can also go look at some examples here. Here's some environments, okay? Uh, so here we have dramatic, atmospheric, maximalist, digital matter painting, right? So what happens is that you specify, right, very briefly like the subject, and then you spend most of the energy specifying all these media effects, and you get something which is beautiful in a particular kind of popular visual culture way. Uh, in fact, I would, and this is I'm going to end here, if computer is already a kind of meta medium, and I call computer meta medium in my 2013 book, Software Takes Command, because computer can simulate not only existing media, so in Photoshop, you know, you can paint, draw, uh, have like a Japanese type of brush, etching, stained glass, uh, but also you can generate new media, I mean, 3D computer graphics, virtual reality, so I call computer meta medium, we can say that AI image synthesis extends it even further. It can simulate effects of numerous artistic media, and it also has knowledge of culture themes, topics, ideas, and stereotypes encoded today in brains of digital image and text pairs. Um, so I'm almost finished. Um, so I have lots of other notes. Uh, and uh, where you, you know, if you want to read the stuff, where are you going to find? Uh, so as I said with my collaborator, um, who is a professor of aesthetics uh, in Italy, but lives in Berlin, we've been kind of publishing a book online. So when we finish a chapter, we put it online. Uh, so here it is. Okay. Oh, sorry, it doesn't work. That didn't work, actually. Oh. Okay, I have to fix. Okay, sorry, I have to fix. My mistake. To go fix the link. Okay, so I guess it's on this year. Sure it is. And uh, we started publishing these chapters last December, before this revolution happened. Uh, and now uh, I'm basically going to take all my notes, including some ideas I presented today, and develop a new chapter. When Emmanuel also has a chapter, so you can go read this all, all here. So that's it. Um, Thank you so much for your attention. As I said, it was a bit of experimental talk where I wanted to introduce a new area of digital culture, AI image generation, and show you a bit my own work, uh, both as an artist, but also somebody who is exploring many tools, and then again using images of others, but also using my own images, my own experiments, develop few theoretical points. So the talk was intentionally not very polished, right? I didn't want to present lots of conclusion. It was really also illustrating how I think and how I participate in digital culture as an artist, thinker, commentator, and somebody who is very happy, uh, very, feels very lucky to be living in this moment and participating in this amazing uh, AI spring, AI revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manovic, uh, for sharing your latest uh, reflections, um, especially your words with AI um, to us. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, the, new for, the new ways uh, and also the new uh, problems or difficulty, difficulties in the creation process with AI. Um, in, in, in a general way, uh, what do you think are the main uh, possibilities of AI uh, um, systems like uh, Midjourney, or and also who, uh, what kind of difficulties are the main ones uh, mm -hmm. for professionals yeah. or creative people? Well, so when we talk about you know digital tools, right, or any area of culture, which which relies on computer technology. It's dangerous, right, to talk about problems because maybe today we have problem, tomorrow problem can be solved. Um, so I can name a few problems which exist today. Maybe these problems will be solved tomorrow or two years from now, or maybe it will never be solved because maybe this technology has inherent limitations. It's hard to say. So right now, as you saw, the system can only recognize like one kind of concept 
So you can maybe put a human figure in a very elaborate environment, or you can make some landscape. But if you try to create composition with like lots of different things, it does not work, right? Uh, another thing is that, so with systems, right, you notice when you when we kind of synthesize people, right, often these people are looking straight at the camera. So it's kind of hard sometimes to get interesting angles. And, and everybody is kind of looking at you. So you know, if you ask a tree, like a tree is parallel to the camera playing. So basically, it has difficult understanding space, right? Again, maybe its limitations will go away in the next few months or two years, hard to say. But right now, uh, it's almost like you get a series of like 2D planes, almost like a matte painting, as opposed to true three-dimensional representation, right? Uh, and then I think the, the third thing, which is most important, which is what I focused on my talk, is that... Uh, and whether this is a problem, right, whether this is a limitation or advantage, it really depends on your point of view, right? As you saw, the system is trained on billions of images, but there are still very particular images, which, uh, uh, let's say, people have rated as more beautiful, and the system was trained to simulate these ratings, right? You saw examples, and these are images which do come from existing, right? Uh, commercial visual culture. Uh, so for beginning users, right, it may be very good because you type a sky and you get beautiful sky and you're happy, but, and maybe you think you're creative, but actually there's nothing creative, right? There's nothing creative about using such as systems. I mean, maybe if you're taking photographs, you're a bit more creative because if you take photographs, yes, also the image is captured automatically and by the time the image is saved to, to, you know, to, to, uh, to your card, it also goes through dozens of algorithms, but at least you can, for now, right, choose the composition. But here you're not choosing anything, right? You type a tree, you know, a girl, you know, a warrior, and then what you get is some kind of synthesis of popular visual culture, which looks reasonably beautiful, and it looks fascinating. And in fact, it's a very special feeling, right? Which kind of, in a way simulates creativity, <laughs> but in reality, there's nothing creative about it, right? You, it's like you're pushing a button and the system does the rest. Now, again, for commercial artists, for people who maybe have more visual training, uh, have been around for longer, maybe we know how to use the system right, in a more precise way. So you can see in my case, I was able to get very particular statics, very particular compositions. But that's because you know, I was in visual arts uh, and also an art historian and uh, practicing artists for 50 years, but it does take the effort. Right, so on the one hand, the system is very powerful. You can very easily create particularly beautiful aesthetic things, but if you want to get something else, you better you have to know what you're doing. And this is, I think, different from, let's say, traditional painting and drawing, where you start right with an like empty canvas, and it's also even different from traditional photography, you know, where you know the selfie I can take and the portrait which professional photographer can take, you know, the second requires lots of training. So it sure seems to me that the system is more democratic, so it does allow lots of people with very little effort to get something, you know, and it's very satisfying. Maybe it's actually creative or not, you know, I have big doubts. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manovic. Uh, síganos acompañando en el foro El Valor del Diseño. Gracias.